also saw there that the government authorities, including the uh, constitutional bodies like Election Commission, used the fake news argument to control access to the information or the media freedom. So that is the key finding. Another is there is no disaggregated data statistics relate, uh, relating to ICT use. Uh, so that, as we said earlier, there is qualitative data and quantitative data. Uh, on the part of quantitative data, we, are, we have very few data and that is not disaggregated. So we cannot analyze uh, that on the gender basis or the social inclusion basis. Mm, there is the absence of laws to protect consumers online. So that is another part. There is new law. Uh, electronic uh, e-commerce bill is uh, in the uh, in the discussion, but there is no uh, law currently to protect consumers online. Online participation of citizens in the law and policy making processes are not explicitly recognized by the law. So public participation is not ensured by the law. There is few measures taken by the government, law and program, to address the challenges faced by the people with disabilities. There is huge digital divide among different groups in country based on gender, geographical coverage, economic status, and uh, disability. And uh, a new trend has uh, evolved where the political parties, they themselves had, uh, have opened the uh, cyber wing within the political parties, which, have, uh, which has developed a sense of uh, self-censorship. And election-related uh, regulation also trampled on the right to information, freedom of expression, opinion, and right to privacy. So these are the key findings, uh, uh, initial findings, based on our research survey uh, and the review of the secondary, uh, secondary literature. Hopefully, this will help also for the uh, upcoming discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sato. It seems that uh, your clicker doesn't work. You couldn't move on. Yeah. Okay, next time, if you can Maybe if you click at the screen, the little screen. Tonight at 5.20 or something like that. No. Okay, then we can ask the... Okay. Maybe. <laughs> also, so for, for the following speakers, we can ask um, <coughs> the technical support uh, to help move the PPT if the clicker doesn't work on you as well. Okay, so now I may ask if our remote speaker can talk now. Can we try Sadaf again? again? Uh, thank you very much again for the opportunity to address this question. Um, I'm going to start out by pointing out that I'm not necessarily a machine learning expert, but it never stopped me from having an opinion. You are still hearing the noise uh, from other sessions? Oh, I'm so sorry for that. It must be annoying. Uh, but can we try for Sadaf? Could you uh, yeah, try to speak? Second, for machine learning, where the learning is achieved by repetition uh, and exposure to training materials, the source material is... Yeah, as the volumes to need to be increased, bias please. Or its lack of bias. In order to detect the bias, you have to distinguish between unbiased results yeah, so that will, uh, and the go results on. that No, it cannot. Bias. But that presupposes that we know what an unbiased model looks like. That may not be so simple to figure out. Second, the, the cases that will test, for, we need cases that will test for bias. We need ways of checking to see whether a model has, is, is manifesting bias. So we need test cases. Transparency, that is to say explainability, is really hard if the algorithm is just a constellation of variable values in a gigantic multi-layer neural network. When someone says, why did it come up with this answer? The answer is, look at all the numbers in the neural network. That's why it came out with this answer. This is not a very satisfying explanation. And finally, we wonder whether bias of an algorithm can be detected purely on the basis of analysis. And that only works it would, it would be desirable, I, sorry, I see my time is up. It would be desirable if we could detect bias by analysis if it turns out that the biases are so infrequent that we can't train the algorithm to detect it using conventional methods. Sorry for going on. Thank Back you, you. Thank you so much. With this, I turn to Monsignor Lucio Adrian, please. Sir. Muchas gracias. Eh, pienso que para poder colaborar con lo que se ha dicho, quisiera analizar el problema desde la cultura, porque creo que la cuestión va más profundo que solamente 
de la cuestión de la inteligencia artificial. Cuando entendemos todo lo que nos viene desde la realidad digital solamente como un aspecto técnico, instrumental, nos es imposible comprender todo lo que significa y lo que implica la cultura digital. Nosotros no estamos en una época tecnológica, estamos en una era digital. Y entonces, si nos quedamos solamente en los aspectos instrumentales, perdemos y no nos interesa, no comprendemos lo que está detrás y lo que está debajo. Por eso, desde mi punto de vista, un aspecto fundamental es la educación para poder comprender la cultura digital. Porque un usuario que conoce, entiende, reclama y produce de una manera distinta. Por lo tanto, si nosotros tuviéramos la capacidad de poder enseñar a nuestros usuarios lo que significa vivir en la cultura digital, podríamos reclamar una transparencia más natural y también los que producen podrían donar una manera de entender y realizar los servicios de la inteligencia artificial de una manera distinta. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you so much. I now move to my other question, beginning with Mr. Mandeep Singh. Uh, what, uh, what are some effective approaches uh, to empower marginalized groups, uh, like in gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, nationality, etc., in defending their digital rights? And what are we right now? I mean, where are we right now in this aspiration? I think we need a new approach that combines the risk-based uh, approach that's been taken, for instance, in the EU with regard to AI systems with a human rights-based approach. Uh, that way we can better defend uh, the marginalized. And we need a correct understanding, as Monsignor was saying, of these technologies. For instance, algorithms by themselves are nothing. You know, it's the training data and then the decision that they propose to humans, their impact on the, the contextual situation. In the old days, software was about data is combined with code, gives you a certain output. AI is about combining the data with the output. That gives you the code, which is your algorithm, which is your model. So we can't just think of the model. We need to think of a life cycle approach to the governance of these technologies. We because. These technologies also cannot be ruled through one single instrument. We need to align the international guidance with the national or regional regulatory frameworks and the industry practices. And that has to be done in an agile way. And finally, we need to be mindful that these systems are applied in specific domains. So the health sector, for instance, has its own very traditional, very classical, but very important governance issues, principles about patient privacy, no harm to patients, etc. So we need to come up with a nuanced guidance for all these domains to better protect those who are vulnerable. Thank you, sir. Thank you. May I turn to Mr. Eugenio Gagliardone now? Oh, thank you. Well, my generation, I, I'm not a digital native, came to, to know or was told that uh, the internet was the space where we're going, we're going to connect the margin. I like to separate the us. And, and now we know that a lot of uh, uh, the story didn't go in that direction. So much so that we need to ask ourselves how we protect these uh, marginalized groups. But I also see a risk here because if we go the normative way, uh, we risk uh, multiplying ad infinitum uh, the claims for representation of smaller and smaller units of diversity. And, and here my suggestion as an academic uh, is, is something that can enrich this debate, uh, is uh, a conversation that academics in the Global South have been having for decades, which is the conversation about decoloniality. So decoloniality re re uh, rejects the normative, uh, is interested in what is contemporary, but is also interested in long-term trajectory how a majority becomes a minority and then a majority again. And how can we propose new images for think about these spaces in different ways? Let's think about how the colonial powers have cut communities that thought of themselves as such into separate minorities in different spaces. And, uh, uh, and my colleague Ashil Mbem, for example, has written beautiful words about uh, how borders 
not didn't exist, but had very much less importance in pre-colonial Africa. Pre-colonial Africa was a space of flows, and values is made when these flows connect. And if we think about it, this idea is very akin to the original idea of the internet in the 1990s. So I see my timing up. I know academics don't think that the role is doing policy, which I think is probably right. And policymakers uh, are too busy to read books, but I think there is a lot of potential there. It's a mind that needs to be uncovered. Thank you. Thank you, great. Um, I would want to know Mr. Tedros' thought on this. Thanks very much. So let me pinpoint two or four points in this regard, right? Number one is to increase its role in promoting digital rights. And in this regard, governments we have to put in place the legislative and policy environments that, uh, you know, enable digital societies to flourish. And number two is for state actors to actually respect digital rights. And three is to ensure that the private sector players actually make known their you know, uh, content moderation policy to the public and actually implement them. And four, I see that uh, you know internet freedom uh, advocates to actually challenge laws and practices that actually stifle uh, digital rights and digital access. Thanks. Back to you. Great. May I now turn to her excellency, Ms. Carolina Stalter, to gain her thoughts on this. Thank you so much. Well, I think um, regarding marginalized groups, the same is true as for the whole internet. There are a lot of potentials in it, but also a lot of risks. While we can empower marginalized South Africa, could you please uh, conclude a bit? Economic inequalities could be reinforced. And, and this is what we have uh, to look at if we are talking about also these groups. We, we have to keep a close eye on facts like, yes, conspiracy theories, for example, fake news, for example. I'm just coming back from Ukraine. Uh, I was there to um, see how the situation on the ground is. We have a new dimension regarding war and that's uh, the information war, and that's done in the internet. So I think uh, we have to be very clear that a lot of risks are in this, or women are facing a lot of violence in the internet. And I'm coming back uh, to my first answer in Austria, we implemented the Communication Platform Act. What does it mean? It means that social media platforms have to delete hatred in the internet, uh, like also anti-Semitic uh, comments, for example, or threat, within 24 hours. And if it is complicated uh, to to see if it's really um, violating someone, then up to seven days, but there has to be a deletion. And while we have now the DSA and the DMA on the European level, we need also global solutions, and that's why... Uh, hello, Sadafo, could you please wrap up a bit? With, with, with could other, you please wrap up? Change our views on that. Thank you, Your Excellency. Mr. Viktor Zmakarovs, your take on this. Thank you. Just to complement what already has been said, uh, I'd like to stress that, again, digital rights are basically the same universal human rights applied in the digital environment. And in this particular case... Uh, thank you, Sadaf. Also, we didn't hear you all of it, but really thank you for excellent work. I mean, given the time delay and also really we couldn't hear those remote speakers talk very clearly, I basically uh, barely heard from you. So uh, let me proceed with the uh, speakers in the room first. Uh, we will see then if we have time and if the issues will be solved by our technical support. And uh, uh, now, I also, by the way, I also like to uh, inform that we actually we have the member of African Parliament from Switzerland in, in the room with us. I and mean, it's really a very useful session while liaising with the key uh, actor, policy makers here. So I really uh, look forward to our uh, excellent pres presentation from the from our national uh, speakers. So the next one I'd like to introduce uh, uh, from Africa continent, uh, Mr. Asra Mulatu, the leading uh, researcher of the Romex assessment project in Ethiopia. Um, are you there, please? Yes. And. Uh, do you have a PPT with the, yes, please, pro, can you please project uh, Asra's uh, PPT on Ethiopia? And also, I, and also, please uh, stick to the five minutes because we're really terribly lagging behind. Thank you.
I'm terribly sorry for all the delays caused by this technical coordination, but as you know that UNESCO is having an interactive map to show all the national assessments. So all the results update will be available on our website for your later following up. Thank you. So can we have the PPT now? So to inform our speakers, I will start with Asra Mulatu from uh, Ethiopia and then follow with Professor Alan Kindu, uh, representing five countries' assessment. And then uh, we have Grace, uh, Grace uh, Chitanga, are you here with us? Okay, excellent. Then after Grace, we are having uh, National Ngo from remote. Maybe we will skip that one. Sorry, National Ngo. So we have three speakers from Africa in the room. So now please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me, uh, I am Asrad from here, like Ethiopia. Uh, I am actually a professor of computer engineering in Addis Ababa Science and Technology University, and I am the lead researcher of the Romex Indicator Assessment of Ethiopia. Uh, so I am going to present, as indicated in the email communication, not the findings and recommendations, but rather the the the, the reflections and you know sharing our experiences in the process, as my friend from Nepal. Uh, say it, it is very important that not only the, the, the outcome but the process which is usually undermined and that is uh, we are here for so next please that have been articulated by these groups so not coming in and telling them what they need but listening to them and addressing them in many cases those needs are are actually rooted in systemic uh, problems in structural problems in discrimination against marginalized groups so I think we need to take a very holistic yeah. approach and not see So these are the presentation outline. I'm going to reflect on basically the, our experience and the methodologies and uh, finally the future efforts, how we are going to improve the, the overall process. Next. Thank you, Ms. Khan. This is the summary of the uh, Romex indicators, IOIs. As you can see, there are uh, 109 core indicators which we have used. Uh, plus some non-core indicators, which we find very important to, you know, identify the gaps in our country. Uh, then there are also international sources, which are very important for us. So, basically, we found the framework to be, you know, very well developed. That I have to stress, uh, because it is well, well organized, uh, well framed. Okay, to assess, uh, find out the gaps of the national uh, internet development. So this is the simplified uh, step we have followed. Uh, we have established a team, core team. Uh, we have de uh, divided the tasks according to the uh, activities pinpointed in the TOR. Uh, we have, uh, you know, refined questionnaires, you know, b because as they are in the Romex framework, we cannot use them as they are. So we have prepared interview questions, you know, uh, questionnaire. Uh, uh, measurements and other other specific uh, questions for specific stakeholders officers and 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 officers then uh, we have uh, you know identified uh, a team structure with sub teams some tabulators and uh, b below them members then we have started data collection through different means like you know uh, letter dissemination so that formally b b some officers requested us formal letter to give us data and information especially government organizations then uh, interview uh, has been uh, you know set up uh, conducted uh, desk research uh, have been you know the key and the the, the foundation of our, our our activity initially because of various reasons in that specific time due to COVID and uh, other national issues. So we have made, you know, s subsequent 
group discussions to refine the, 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 the data we have got. And frequent meeting and follow-up is very important that we have found out. Then we have uh, went to data analysis and interpretation, which took us too much time uh, and energy in terms of you know lack of data in some aspects. Okay, and we are going to go for second round and third round data collection due to uh, after this we, we went back again. So the, we went to write up um, based on whatever we have got due to the uh, time and dynamicity of the nature. So we have done that one. Then we uh, come up with a draft report and which shared uh, locally, national uh, reviewers, four reviewers, and international reviewer. Uh, then we have learned in the process so many things. Uh, uh, as, as I said, it is very uh, key to start early and, you know, uh, progress consistently, which is very important. We have seen that due to va various problems, we have you know fluctuated in terms of consistency and you know lack the, the the rhythm to continue as we have started. Then core, you know, the the core team should be you know uh, ICT aware and technically you know uh, competent. That will be very essential to progress in in the same in the same rhythm as the whole sub teams work independently and come together for discussion. Uh, then we have to share responsibilities, you know, personal acquaintance is very important that we have found out, even though you, you are knocking some government offices again and again formally, you know, uh, politely, whatever means, they, they will not open. So informally through friends and acquaintances we have uh, be able to find some uh, data and uh, information. Then we are uh, going to start whatever we have got to analyze and develop some kind of you know uh, c content from the whatever we have obtained. Then we have uh, done regular you know brainstorming sessions and focus group discussions among some some stakeholders. Then we have uh, you know uh, some issues in the in terms of deciding the financial breakdown because the, the organization I am working the university is government funded. It is government. Based and it follows, you know, government rules and regulations to, you know, for the procurement in financial administration, which sometimes become another indicator for us to work with. Very, very tough sometimes. So project management will be very important. The whole process. We have, you know, so many uh, opportunities and challenges we have faced. Uh, as I said, I have to stress the the framework is very, very uh, well developed. That will be very easy for us to understand and start as early as possible. Uh, then the core team, yes, we have reshuffled due to some you know, lack of ICT background know-how, which will be very important. Then we conducted you know, uh, a very conducive area we have got in, in our university, the AI and Robotics Center of Excellence, which we have worked day and night to come up with the results and findings and the recommendations. Then uh, a strong national context understanding from the core team members we have established. That will be very important because of their uh, educational background and work experience. Uh, then we have you know, uh, identified some uh, national ICT related you know, problems and challenges to, to, to identify and incorporate in, in the, into the further workers, which we have already developed a couple of uh, proposals from these out outcomes and submitted to uh, uh, relative relevant organizations. So there are many you know, challenges uh, at, at the, at the uh, award of the, uh, the the project, we have in the process of establishing new government. That will be very tough for us to, to go and find data from government offices due to various reasons as uh, stipulated there. Then we have internal conflicts, unfortunately. Then that will be another uh, problem to come up with. And the fund administration questionnaire response rate will be very tough due to various reasons, which I'm going to explain later. Then lack of organic national data repository we don't have. Okay, uh, The Ethiopian standard uh, statistics agency doesn't have any indicator questionnaire in the uh, census that it is conducting you know, uh, regularly. Then uh, there are lots of misunderstandings of the questionnaires, the indicators, because of so many issues which I'm going to show. Uh, then uh, that should be refined again and again. Uh, Asra, excuse me, could you please wrap up in a all right, minute? All right. Sorry. The map process is very important, very helpful, but uh, we need to have, you know, contextualize it together with uh, the, 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 the lead researchers and the, the members of the team so that some of the, you know, processes should be contextualized to the 
to the fact in, on the ground, okay, that we have uh, found out. So the MAM members could be collaboratively updated with the, the researchers. And then the meteorology, I've said it is well uh, established, but there are, you know, some issues that we have found out, okay. Uh, these are the issues we have found out and uh, uh, some questions, okay, as indicated here, okay, some of the respondents said so many questions in one indicator, so many, you know, uh, measurements in, in one, so this is one uh, uh, question uh, in the right, okay, indicator, RC2, that is how we have coded it, then it, there are so many things within it, okay, then there are indicators, four core indicators, within them there are so many, you know, issues they have to raise so they complained how could we respond to all of this at the same time or from one organization they are representing so this is the email communication they have complained about okay uh, so one of the respondents so we have followed this general approach which is already in the tor well well stipulated uh, both in the in the work process plus writing the report so so in the future, uh, impact assessment should be done, yes. Then we have to you know, uh, devise a strategy to do so, which is very important. So sharing the findings and their implementation will be very uh, important. In already stakeholders are identified, notified in the national uh, uh, validation workshop that other you know, means and mechanisms should be you know, uh, find out how to be successful in this uh, endeavor. So the, the, the the other question, which is very interesting in the email communication, I found out is why don't we do it beyond the national assessment, which is very interesting. For example, Ethiopia and Djibouti. Of course, Ethiopia is going to be humiliated, I know, but in terms of ecosystem, digital ecosystem, our digital ecosystem is poor, I know that, but it will be very good to see for our you know, decision makers to see the difference among, you know, in terms of population and other variables, the internet is poor, so why that is so and how we are going to broaden the already started, you know, efforts by the government of Ethiopia, the, the new government. So th these initiatives, good initiatives should be, you know, broadened and implemented. So th this will be a very nice indicator in Horn of Africa, Eastern Africa, then continental, that will be a very good uh, very thing. This is thank you in my mother tongue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are collecting the PPT from our speakers, so uh, please do stick to five minutes presentation. But if other participants want to have it, we can share it by email. You can contact me and my colleague Xiao Jie there. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite uh, Professor Alan Kindu, uh, UNESCO chair based in the University of Bogotá, Montaigne, to, uh, uh, to present five countries uh, assessment in Benin, Niger, Cote d'Ivoire, Congo, and our uh, IRD. So, uh, so, so, Professor, it seems a uh, mission impossible to present uh, five countries in five uh, minutes. So, maybe uh, how about eight minutes? <laughs> Please go straight to the key findings and the key recommendations because we are able to share your PPT with the participants later. So, uh, we can have everybody can do the presentation later after you. Thank you. Please take the floor. En français. Donc, euh, je vais essayer de parler euh, doucement pour que vous puissiez comprendre. Euh, Est-ce que vous pouvez partager le PowerPoint, le PPT, s'il vous plaît? Hello. 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 Could you, sir, please uh, project uh, Professor Kindus PPT on the screen? Thank you. Alors, donc, en attendant que le PowerPoint soit, soit diffusé, donc je, je rappelle que... Uh, Is there, there a translation? Oh, excellent. So please, uh, that's good news. So there's translation for Day Zero event. Thank you. Um, I think digital colonialism is certainly something I understand it's not uh, and to think about, um, particularly in the voilà. digital space. The PowerPoint is in English, so you can understand it easily. Yeah. Voilà. Voilà. Okay, so you can just look at the PowerPoint. 
Donc, je disais que j'ai travaillé sur euh, plusieurs pays, euh, donc le, le Bénin, euh, le, le Niger. Donc, le Bénin, le travail est complètement fini. Le Niger et la Côte d'Ivoire, on est en train de conclure et euh, on a débuté avec les deux Congo, la République démocratique du Congo et le Congo Brazzaville. Donc, vu le temps dont je dispose, je ne vais pas euh, présenter pays par pays, mais je vais essayer de faire une petite analyse euh, transversale qui permet de faire ressortir un certain nombre de, de points saillants. Alors, j'espère que ça va marcher. Voilà, donc au niveau de, euh, des, constats, euh, des constats généraux, euh, on peut dire que l'ensemble de, des pays que, que je viens d'évoquer ici euh, dispose d'un écosystème euh, numérique qui est assez dynamique, euh, avec euh, un cadre juridique hein, qui, euh, pour le cas de certains pays, reste encore à consolider. Donc on va se rendre compte que les stratégies sont différentes. Pour le Bénin, par exemple, on a mis en place un code du numérique assez complet, même si ça n'intègre pas les préoccupations qui sont liées au numérique avancé et la RDC suit également cette mouvance puisqu'ils sont en train de valider actuellement euh, le code euh, du numérique. Et pour les autres pays, le Niger, le Congo et la Côte d'Ivoire, le choix a été de ne pas se lancer dans la rédaction d'un code du numérique mais de s'appuyer simplement sur une série de textes de loi. Euh, en termes de liberté de presse, hein, même si euh, les, les avancées euh, sont remarquables, mais dans la plupart de ces pays, euh, le, les classements qui, sont, qui existent au niveau international, notamment ceux de Reporters sans frontières, permettent de voir qu'il y a beaucoup de fragilité qui, qui, qui demeure. Et euh, souvent même, les, les, les gouvernements assument pleinement le fait de couper Internet, ils considèrent que c'est normal, notamment pendant les crises et les périodes électorales. Donc, euh, les institutions qui ont été mises en place ont fait des efforts particuliers pour euh, essayer notamment de normaliser les critères d'octroi de licence, mettre en place une certaine tra tra transparence, mais euh, on observe quand même euh, sur le plan notamment de, de, de l'ouverture qu'il il n'y a pas dans l'ensemble des cinq pays cités des véritables politiques de développement des ressources éducatives libres et on ne on voit pas aussi des, des politiques de développement des, des contenus en, en, en langue locale. Donc là, ça, ça reste des, des efforts à faire dans ces différents pays. On, on va noter également qu'au niveau de l'accessibilité, euh, le point faible dans les cinq pays reste euh, notamment la prise en compte de la situation, enfin des personnes en situation de, de handicap. Et il y a aussi le fait que les coûts d'accès, euh, notamment selon les utilisateurs, restent, restent très élevés. Et comme partout ailleurs, on va remarquer également les inégalités entre le milieu rural et, et, et la ville. Mais de façon générale, on a quand même une croissance euh, continue en termes d'abonnement. Euh, concernant la, la situation des, de, concernant les personnes en situation de handicap, on peut noter quand même qu'il y a des pays qui ont commencé à faire un certain nombre d'efforts, notamment la Côte d'Ivoire, qui a intégré au niveau du ministère de en charge du numérique, une personne qui est en situation de handicap et qui s'occupe de réfléchir, de coordonner et de mettre en place un programme d'accessibilité pour les personnes ayant un, un handicap. Voilà euh, en termes d'accessibilité euh, et en termes de, de participation multi-acteurs, bien entendu, il y a des efforts qui sont également euh, réalisé, ça reste disparate en, en fonction des, des pays. On va remarquer par exemple qu'en Côte d'Ivoire, les dispositifs sont très visibles, euh, notamment sur le site internet du, du, du ministère, mais ce n'est pas le cas en, au Niger et, et dans, 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 dans les deux Congo. Donc, euh, la... Euh, 
au niveau, par exemple, de, de la collaboration avec la, la société civile, là, c'est assez général. Euh, les, les collègues qui font partie de la société civile et qui participent euh, notamment aux réflexions sur la gouvernance d'Internet ne bénéficient pas facilement de facilité pour pouvoir euh, participer euh, aux, aux événements internationaux comme euh, celui qui nous réunit aujourd'hui. Donc par rapport à ce tableau, on a fait un certain nombre de, de recommandations et donc, parmi euh, les recommandations, on a demandé qu'on puisse renforcer le cadre juridique hein, pour prendre en compte les avancées actue actuelles du, 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 du numérique. Et euh, on a demandé également de renforcer le, le cadre institutionnel, de promouvoir les contenus et les données euh, ouvertes, euh, de et mettre en place une politique euh, adaptée euh, aux personnes en situation de handicap. Et dans les pays comme la Côte d'Ivoire, où cette politique existe, mais n'est pas appliquée, puisqu'il y a un cahier de charge qui a été rédigé et qui a été remis notamment aux opérateurs de téléphonie mobile, mais qui n'est pas appliqué. Donc, veillez à ce que ce cadre en question soit, soit, soit appliqué. Et on a demandé également euh, une mise en place d'une politique efficace de gestion des déchets électroniques, parce que ça, c'est aussi une problématique importante qui, généralement, n'est pas, pas prise euh, plus en compte. Donc, on a fait une série de, de, de recommandations de, 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 de ce genre. On a demandé euh, aussi euh, un certain nombre de choses, notamment la création d'un observatoire d'Internet ou, ou du numérique, euh, voire de l'intelligence artificielle. Ça nous permettrait de, de, de faire face au manque de données criards hein, qui, qui existent dans, dans dans ces différents pays, puisqu'on a du mal à avoir des données récentes dans, dans le domaine du, du numérique. Et également, peut-être créer une structure nationale de mesures et de promotion de la liberté d'expression qui serait comme euh, un, euh, un tableau de bord pour voir s'il y a des avancées qui sont réalisées euh, ou, ou pas. Et surtout, ce qui est très important, c'est ce qu'on leur a demandé également, c'est de mettre en place euh, un comité de suivi des, des, des recommandations. Et là, euh, j'espère que l'UNESCO nous aidera à faire en sorte que cela soit, soit effectif, parce que les recommandations qui sont généralement euh, faites ne sont pas toujours appliquées. Euh, ça dépend parfois des pays, mais ce serait bien qu'on euh, qu ait euh, euh, ce, ce suivi-là qui soit, qui soit systématique, notamment tout, euh, tout, tous les deux ans. Donc voilà en gros euh, ce que je pourrais dire par rapport aux recommandations qu'on a faites. Mais il y avait aussi d'autres questions qu'on nous avait posées, notamment sur comment faire évoluer euh, le, le processus en question. Et euh, notre expérience nous amène à penser qu'il faut... Euh, euh, faire en sorte que euh, le conseil consultatif euh, se limite à faire euh, des propositions. Euh, on a remarqué que dans la pratique, le conseil sont consultatif, surtout quand il y a beaucoup de personnes qui représentent le ministère du numérique, a tendance parfois à prendre le rapport en main et, en main et à modifier complètement le rapport, ce qui lui permet, ce qui fait qu'à la fin, on arrive à avoir des rapports qui sont quasiment dilués, insipides, parce que tout ce qui dérange le, euh, le, le pouvoir en place a été... Euh, a été enlevé parce qu'ils ne comprennent pas qu'il s'agit d'un diagnostic qui permet d'aller euh, très loin, mais ils ont l'impression que c'est le ministère qui est jugé à, à, par, à, à partir de, de, de ce rapport. Donc là, c'est assez délicat, je sais, que si le rapport n'est pas accepté par le ministère, il ne sera pas, les recommandations ne seront pas appliquées. Mais je pense qu'il y a une vraie réflexion à mener là-dessus pour voir comment on arrive à concilier ces, ces, ces différentes ces, ces différentes 
la préoccupation. Voilà en gros euh, ce que je peux vous dire par rapport à, à l'expérience que j'ai euh, à travers euh, ces différents, le, le travail mené dans ces différents pays. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. Merci beaucoup, professeur Kenyindou. Bravo pour compléter cinq pays en plus de sept minutes. Je vous invite Grace Kitajia, le convenor de Kikinet, représentant nos projets en Kenya. Vous savez, Kenya est le seul pays au monde qui a pu conduire le second assessment après le premier, qui a été fait deux ans avant, pour réaliser le type de tracking de l'assessement et de l'assessement. Policy improvement. So, Grace, could you please take the floor? Uh, thanks, uh, Zian Hong. Uh, I'm going to be very brief and uh, so that you're also able to recover the minutes uh, because what I have to say is very brief. So, Kenya, we, like Zian Hong had said, we already did a first assessment which we launched in 2020 and then we proposed to look into into what has happened in the last two years. So we, we have been assessing the developments that have taken place, and especially because of COVID, so many things uh, took place. Uh, for example, uh, COVID changed the way uh, people conduct themselves uh, online. There were more users. There are more users online, but even with more users, there are now more abuses uh, that are conducted online, you know, uh, uh, incidents of cybercrime. So in the second uh, assessment, uh, we considered several things uh, in light of COVID-19 dynamics and areas that we have updated include in all the sections what has the impact of COVID been in, in terms of accessibility, openness, multi-stakeholderism because laws were produced during um, COVID and uh, so we are assessing was there participation by stakeholders in participating in coming up with these laws that were were happening, uh, we are also um, we've also updated the statistics uh, to reflect the current state of play, and uh, this is in terms of users of internet. Uh, users of mobile phone, uh, broadband, um, uh, adop adoption of broadband, etc. So we are we, we we also have been looking into the laws that have been updated, the policies and regulations that have either been amended, have been done away with, and the new ones that are coming up and have been put in place. In addition, we are looking at what are the current developments uh, and implementation aspects because one of the things we have found out is that we have, in Kenya, we have many laws, many progressive laws, many supportive laws. However, uh, implementation is an issue. Uh, because there is slowness in implementing that and as the speed is not very high, we have more people coming up with new laws. So we are looking into that. And of course, uh, the aim is to show progress of the last two years, what happened between 2020 and 2022, as well as what has changed, uh, what has been implemented, what is the progress made? Are there new indicators that we need to look into, for example, issues of artificial intelligence and the gaps that hinder development? And ultimately, uh, you know, as we finalize the report, we'll be providing recommendations uh, to this. So again, Kiktanet con considers this process uh, as very important uh, because um, the, the, the publication is going to be yet another milestone that, uh, you know, that brings all this information in one, you know, at, at one stop where you can find different indicators. And, um, and, and so we, we, we think it's also going to be very useful in terms of contributing to the development of sound policy, legal, 
uh, regulatory and technical approaches and responses that shall ultimately promote the development, continue to promote the development of ICT uh, sector in Kenya. And one of the things that we have realized and which we have noted is that every time we have the Kenya IGF and even the global IGF, we realize that the themes are actually informed by the indicators um, that we continue to review. So we are glad because I'm sure we might be the f among the first countries that are doing a review. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace, for your wonderful and brief presentation. Um, actually, we have finished the speakers on site from the African panel. Uh, National Ngo from uh, um, Namibia, I'm sorry I'm escaping you, but uh, I hope our online speakers stay online. Once we finish all the speakers on site, we'll try again with you. Perhaps the techniques will be solved then. Thank you for your patience. Now I'm very happy to introduce a very strong panel from Latin America. Uh, we have of three of uh, excellent presentation from uh, uh, Argentina newly completed congratulations and then we have uh, the uh, the first uh, assessment done in this project from Brazil we also have the uh, the, the Paraguay uh, projects also present here to 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 show the results so um, Gonzalez Busto Fati uh, is the associate researcher at the Center of Technology and the Society Studies CITES and the director of this Rome project in Argentina. Um, I'd like you to take the floor and um, start your presentation. I think uh, your PPT is already yeah, on the screen. You can ask the technical support to move forward. Uh, we don't you. have a clicker. Uh, the I click, just ask them. The, the clicker doesn't work. Ah, yes. It's <laughs> for anxiety. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Hello, colleagues, Rome sirs. Um, I thought about our job for a week. so. <laughs> uh, my name is Gonzalo Bustos. I come from Argentina, the southest country in the world, uh, the Center of, for, Center of Studies for Technology and Society of the University of San Andres. Um, I'm associate researcher over there. I had the pleasure and the honor to lead this investigation, a collective team of seven researchers. And I had a co-director, and we had different teams for different dimensions in order to, to secure the best report in each case. Um, I'm going to be fast because I have Alexander taking the time right next to me. So uh, we did Im Im implemented a multi-stick advisory board that was such a challenge, and we pulled it through. We it was in integrated. It is integrated. We're still running. Integrated by 17 members of all sectors. Three plenary meetings we had, and besides that, we had different interviews. Uh, this is the membership of the of the. I'm going to pass it quite fast, but. As you can see, there are certain names you can see popping up, Google them. In the government, you had the three branches. That is important. We always say, well, the, the state is the government. We had the legislative and the judicial branch as well. And we had 22 in-depth in interviews, 11 with the MAP members, 11 with the key form informants of the community in Argentina. And we have a discussion group especially focused on access with six members of the MAP. And the evaluation methodology was to use um, what a recommendation by the Bible. I, I, I had the Bible, I call it Bible, for like one year in my desk. And now I see the responsible. Thank you so much. So great. Uh, you have a lot of info, there a lot of options. And we chose this one. I'm going to go fast to this. Uh, this the. Um, the traffic light uh, is quite subjective, of course, but it, it, it can g give you a lot of sense of urgency. If you want to address and and to make policymakers uh, take an uh, interest in what you're doing, you have to do ca these kind of things. And so w we level all 25 themes of all the five dimensions, and we saw the situation in each case. And of course, the predominant trend is yellow. Some things are going up, some things are going down, some things are stagnated, and some things are quite well uh, handled. That's why they're green. But some issues are quite critical, and this could be the two things I would like to say about the report. The, 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 the trend is like a... Um, 
a continuation uh, trend, mid, uh, sorry, a discontinuity trend with an innovation trend. That is, the, the policymakers innovate. We were the first country in the region with a CERT uh, as a center for resp uh, response to incidents uh, and in cybernetic incidents. And we were the first country considered adequate in its protection of data protection. But we got lost in the in the evolution of the ecosystem. So we see those three trends, and it's kind of like familiar to all the region of Latin America. And the other thing, well, it's based on this. So the three critical issues are right to privacy, where we, we didn't, we don't have a adequate law to this m moment. Uh, we had a, a integral law, but uh, sanctioned in 2000, the year 2000. Imagine what it needs to be in incorporated into that law. But uh, I'm going to spoil the finish line of the, the, the presentation. Fortunately, since we had finished the report, it took us 11 months, and we finished it in April. And since that, since that moment, the uh, Data Authority application presented a new bill. So I don't know if it's because of this report, but uh, what I can say is that the maximum authorities in the country regarding science and technology read this report. The other things are cybersecurity that is still critical in Argentina. Uh, there was recently a change of uh, authority application. We will see where it goes. And equitable access, that is key to, uh, to get what Maria Elsa mentioned, uh, meaningful connectivity. This is a, a, a block in, uh, this blocks this kind of development in Argentina. So we made 63 recommendations. How much, what is my time? I have 35 seconds. We made 63 recommendations for all the teams involved, and we identified 10 objectives as critical, and we did 63 recommendations for those. Uh, I, I just wanted to sh show you a, a, an example. For example, of course, up updating the personal data protection law, that is for sure, designing a comprehensive, sustainable, and coordinated strategy regarding national intelligence activities, because intelligence is not included in the law, uh, creating a body to monitor the communication interceptions. We have a lot to do in privacy not only in data protection in Argentina. Not only that, we also made recommendations regarding uh, internet uh, access and universalization. Uh, we can share this with anyone, of course. We will be happy to, to, to share it. And I think this is it. Ah, yes, some challenges faced during the process. What was the most difficult task? Um, well, of course, some were mentioned. Access to statistical data, especially aggregated data, disaggregated data. Second, this was particularly difficult. Balance the research with the mal involvement, where we should focus in involving new stakeholders and more stakeholders and socializing the results and uh, making them understand the process or focusing on the, the research. And at the beginning, it was quite difficult to understand that both were interlinked. And um, well, we have a very polarized, very polarized political environment in Argentina. So making both parties participate was also a challenge. We managed to, but in one plenary meeting, there was one side and the other one was the other. So like they, they took turns. So and f finally, elaboration of specific and situation recommendations, not abstract, not generalistic, but uh, situated and nuanced recommendations. And well, that's what I m mentioned before. What happened since we finished the report? Uh, well, data protection law is coming into place. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shahon. Thank you, UNESCO. Thank you, Satik. <laughs> Thank you. Fellow Romexers. <laughs> Three, 300 indicators in five minutes. No, 109. <laughs> we did the 109. That's why I, I could put it in five minutes. Yeah, thank you so much, Gonzalo, for this fascinating uh, sharing. It's my third time to hear your presentation. Every time I, I learn something new. I think Simon just uh, whispered to me, do you know, Xianhong, that uh, traffic light uh, innovation has been also adopted by the by the research in Mongolia? Really? <laughs> so, so you have done uh, something really good practice to be shared. Nice. Thank you so nice much. <laughs> and uh, we are in a pipeline to publish the Argentina report in our series as a, uh, as a uh, example of ex excellence uh, in the forthcoming months, so you'll be able to download the full version of the Argentine report. The same we're doing for the Ethiopia report as well. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, the next speaker from Latin America region to present a project in Paraguay, uh, Mr. Eduardo Carrillo, representing the Association of Technology, Education, Development, Research, and Communication, TEDIC. So uh, could you please take the floor?
Yes, here. Thank you so much. I think I'm not going to have the powers of Gonzalo to <laughs> <laughs> summarize that fastly uh, or indicator. So I'm going to stick to a script that I sort of like worked on. Um, so uh, I, my name is Eduardo Carrillo. I am from Paraguay. I work at a civil society organization called TEDIC, who did the research of the Romex indicators uh, in partnership with the Ministry of ICT. So this partnership was quite instrumental. Oops, I don't know what happened there. Um, this partnership was quite instrumental in terms of um, conducting the research and collect, collecting the data from different sources. Much like all the different presentations that precede me, we did both uh, a desk-based research, FOIA requests, and consultation of credible sources that we were able to access through the uh, Romex, uh, sorry, through the partnership with the Ministry of ICTs. Uh, it's important to point out that this research was conducted between April and October of 2019. So going to uh, Shanghan's point, uh, of course, things evolve and change uh, very fastly in the uh, in the technological environment, but I would argue at the same time that perhaps the regulation of the technology doesn't change that fastly. So I think that even regardless of the fact that the uh, the research that we did is from 2019, much of the regulatory framework has not necessarily changed. Uh, so this is of course something good in terms of the relevance of the report and not so good perhaps in terms of how uh, regulation evolves according to technological evolution as well. Um, just in terms of um, the multi-stakeholder advisory board, which was a board that was uh, formed uh, to advise the, the, the researchers, it was multi-stakeholder by nature. It had representatives from the state, civil society, and academia. And some of the academics were also from the technical community, but they are affiliated to academic spaces. And they were quite instrumental in terms of giving feedback to uh, all the information that was collected and uh, the relevance or not. Uh, in terms of times or due to time constraints, I will only describe the main findings in the rights and cross-cutting issue section. Um, so in terms of rights, as you can see, uh, Paraguay has a robust human rights regulatory framework, such as the right to privacy, freedom of expression, access to public information, and others. Uh, what stands out the most, or what did stand out to us the most, was the fact that there is an existing harmonization between the public international rights norms and the human rights and national constitution. And although there is no explicit normative that equates online to offline rights, uh, both the judiciary and to some extent the executive power extends and acts accordingly uh, to the understanding that the online rights are the same as the one on the offline uh, environment. Um, in terms of recommendations for this section, the one that particularly stands out for us is the fact that Paraguay still needs a new personal data protection law for Paraguay. Unlike the Argentinian case, who is in the process of reviewing the law, we don't really ever had a law that is a comprehensive data protection law that could be considered as such, and that there is an essential confusion with uh, an existing law credit related data that is not sufficient to protect people's rights. Uh, so the recommendation that we put in the report is that the law proposal should be and must be in line with more protective and robust legislation. Uh, and since last year, so this is outside of the uh, data that was collected between uh, in 2019, there is a bill project that has been collaboratively worked uh, between civil society, the public sector, and the private sector. And it's an interesting uh, personal data protection regulation that is currently in discussion in Congress. So we urgently uh, are in need of that bill to be discussed. And I think it's also a good opportunity to say that we need a new report uh, of the Romex in Paraguay uh, in order to reflect that there is uh, new laws that are in discussion that could potentially give more uh, information for the report. In terms of cross-cutting indicators, uh, there is a particular difficulty that was uh, suffered, I would say, uh, across all uh, the research. And I think it's something that I heard in other uh, interventions. And it's the fact that there isn't, or there is an absence of disaggregated evidence or disaggregated data that is needed to build a more assertive and evidence-based policy. Uh, 
in our context. Uh, and from this perspective, and particularly for the cross-cutting sections, oops, sorry, I didn't uh, move that. Um, data on online abuse and harassments are, uh, are insufficient to sort of like understand the landscape. And there is a lack of, of, of accountability from public institutions regarding this data collection that could help measure the impact of online gender-based violence, uh, especially towards women and ch specifically towards women and children. Um, and in regarding to children in particular, there is a proper uh, lack of collection of disaggregated data by responsible institutions uh, who per perhaps have uh, the will to do this kind of collections but don't have at this point the capacity to really understand uh, and have data related to the use and perception of children uh, towards internet and ICTs. Uh, and much like uh, in the issue of gender and, 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 and disaggregated data, uh, in regards to sustainable development and the ethical and legal aspects, there is a lack of proper monitoring mechanisms for projects related to the use of the internet and ICT that are led by the state and that could be linked uh, to the evolution and completion of the SDGs in, in the country. Uh, so in the end, it's an issue of uh, the state not having the capacity of measuring the effectiveness of their policies in general. Um, so in terms of lessons learned, which is uh, more of a general reflection, I would say, um, the develop and in relation to the development of the Romex methodology, the composition of different bodies of val validation has proven useful uh, for a robust data validation uh, in our research. But at the same time, it was very difficult for the researchers to commit to, uh, let's say, uh, a steady and a stable um, commitment with these ad hoc bodies because they are by nature ad hoc uh, and it's something that needs to be taken into account for future uh, additions of this re research in Paraguay. Um, and also I would like to point out that in a context like ours where the development of research is quite difficult, it's very important to highlight the willingness of the government in this particular case to produce evidence uh, related to ICTs and the internet and particularly with a rights-based rights approach such as the one that the Romex uh, brings to the table. So I would say those are some of our main lessons and I hope I didn't pass the five minutes. <laughs> uh, thank you. I don't. I'm so intrigued by your presentation. I didn't even look at my watch. I, I trust it to be okay. Now I'm inviting uh, Alexander Barbosa, representing CDIC.br, which means the Regional Center for Studies on the Development of the Information Society, uh, to present the project in Brazil and also all your insights and v visions. Because Alexander is really one of the godfathers of Romex indicators. CDIC.br uh, and our his leadership not only uh, support the entire consultation of developing the indicator, but also conducting the uh, pilot assessment, then eventually deliver the first uh, uh, full assessment of indicators. So really, your insights are most valuable. Please uh, relax and uh, um, finish your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Shan Hong, for your kind words. Good, mo uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm not going to use the slide for the sake of time. Uh, you will have access to the detailed content of the slides, so I will just very brief give some uh, messages. Well, CETIC uh, is a UNESCO Category 2 center based in Sao Paulo, Brazil, covering, covering Latin American countries and uh, Portuguese pinky countries in Africa. We have been working very closely uh, to UNESCO, and we are linked to the Brazilian Network Information Center, NIC.br. And I, I would like to start by saying that uh, this whole concept of internet universality was born thanks to LACNIC and NIC.br that has uh, commissioned the first paper that uh, was uh, written and then it evolved to this concept of Romex uh, indicator. So there is no need to highlight uh, anymore the relevance of this uh, framework for the internet development, uh, because we know that uh, measuring its development in a broader uh, approach that goes beyond uh, infrastructure and uh, access is really um, amazing. So this uh, framework is really very important for, for, I would say, all countries, but uh, particularly in Latin America, where we have a, a lot of disparities. And in case of Brazil, we, um, after 
UNESCO has approved the ROMAX framework in the um, General Conference in 2015, we have conducted uh, two consultations, regional consultations, and then we piloted this framework in 2018 and conducted the real uh, data collection in 2019 and published the first uh, ROMAX country report. Uh, but um, apart from that, we have also uh, peer-reviewed Argentina's report and um, Paraguay report and Uruguayan report, and we have provided uh, technical support to Germany, to Peru, to Namibia, and to Tunisia. Uh, this is a, a very important work that those countries that has already conducted the, the, the assessment can provide um, support and create a community of Rome Xers, which is uh, really very important. But le let me finish by saying that um, post-COVID-19, we have a new challenge that we could incorporate in the Romex uh, framework. And I would highlight, highlight uh, two very important issues. Um, especially in case of Brazil, we have a very uh, solid uh, legal framework on internet governance, on data protection, but, and infrastructure is well developed, but we still have the challenge of deploying the 5G networks in the, not only in the capital cities that we have already 5G implemented, but in the whole country and also IoT. So we have to foster uh, productivity um, of the companies by using new emerging technologies or, and also AI. But there is also a very important uh, initiative in the country related to privacy and data protection. It was identified in our first report back in 2018. Uh, our general data protection law was not approved yet. At that time, it was approved. We have established the National Agents for Data Protection, and we have just launched a full report on privacy and personal data protection that I would highly recommend that this dimension would be included in the Romex indicators, as well as new emerging technologies such as AI. And in this particular regard, uh, Brazil has also approved the, the National Strategy for AI, and uh, Nick.br is in charge of um, establishing the um, National Observatory for AI using AI indicators. And in this particular regard, CETIC has already implemented two years ago a set of very few indicators on the usage of AI in enterprises, government, uh, education, and health. So today, we have just published the uh, first series of uh, indicators on the use of AI that will be incorporated in this National Observatory of AI. So uh, just to finish, uh, Shen Hong, I would say that um, our challenge in the Romex framework is to include new dimensions, like uh, it was already said, and you mentioned uh, meaningful connectivity, uh, data economy and governance, uh, included, included uh, privacy and personal data protection, uh, issues on this disinformation and misinformation, artificial intelligence, and cross-cutting issues uh, that goes uh, beyond gender issues or child online protection. We have to uh, really to make it more updated. Uh, Post-pandemic era has changed many, many things that should be incorporated in the Romex. So with that, uh, I will finish. And thank you, Shen Hong, and congratulate UNESCO for this important achievement. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think the door is just signaled to me. You want to uh, raise a question now? Yeah. Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Xiang Hong. And this is for all of those who have been involved in this work. It's been fascinating listening to you because I was just thinking how many millions of dollars have been spent, whether it is the AU, the ECE, ECA, ADB, uh, European Development Bank, Asia Development Bank, we have had so much investment in this sector. And as you are speaking, there's no reference to the impact that any of this funding has made. What are we to conclude? Because when, if we just take your traffic light, very basic things 
are still in red. Comment, please help me out because I'm confused listening to this. It's UNDP, uh, uh, World Bank itself, all the development banks in Latin America, huge investments. What happened? Is it just been on infrastructure and it is only Romex which is now reminding us that this is a broader societal kind of implication? Please. Thank you, Darcy, for this very sharp question. Um, if uh, anyone wants to react immediately, Otherwise, I would like to try with our technical support. Uh, sure, please Sorry. sit here. Um, hey, uh, use that one, this one, that one. Apologies, um, I am late. This is um, Henriette Esserhuisen. I was part of the process of developing the, the indicators. And um, well, one of the, f I mean, this is not a response to Dorothy's very challenging meta question. It's a very existential question, Dorothy. Um, but um, in, 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 in response to Alexandra's input, one of the feedbacks that we get is that the indicators are too many, too long, too complex. So if we are going to add new ones, have you or others who have applied the indicators found some that we could remove? So is, the, is it just a, quest, a, a case of adding to address contemporary issues, or do you think there's also an opportunity to actually condense or maybe collapse or merge some of the indicators to make sure that it's a manageable tool? Thank you. Alexandra, please. Yes, Henriette, uh, you are completely right. Uh, since the beginning, we at CETIC, as you know, our main mission is to measure the adoption and use and impact of ICT. So, uh, and we did participate very act act actively, but we believe that uh, t we have too many indicators. And I think that, and we need to include new ones post uh, COVID-19. So we should exclude and uh, consolidate some indicators. It, it's too many, but I, I believe that the, the beauty of this framework, uh, and all of you, um, we're part of this uh, beautiful uh, result, is that we are talking about new issues that go beyond access and connectivity. Mm. We deal uh, with the human, high, uh, human rights and other social issues. So it's not a matter of uh, eliminating dimensions, but eliminating indicators. Uh, thank you, Alexandra. Simon, please. Yeah, I, I mean, there's, two, there's two clear techniques to start with. Firstly, there are already in the indicators many which are duplicated that are listed in several categories. And, and one of the things I see in reports is there's a need for cross-referencing. Um, things should only be described once in the report and then just referred to where they're needed. Um, secondly, they should be indicators. They should be not necessarily be a direct measure of everything concerned, but an indicator that captures that key dimension. And I think that's one of the keys to what you were saying, Alexander, that, that, that by reducing to essentials in some areas, because clearly we still need something about access, especially in Africa. Um, and also, one of the things that emerges in all countries is that sense of, you know, in every country, there is that remote area or disadvantaged community, and I think of the disabled both in terms of devices and technicalities on the one side and access and applications on the other, um, that clearly still need to be addressed and, and are still critical. So, so, so the, there's a balance and, and a way of reducing here which, which um, needs to be worked through. Uh, thank you, Sam. Anyone else want to intervene on this question from Dorothy? Um, we are having the strategic discussion in half an hour. I suppose we can continue discussion on this as well. Meanwhile, uh, tomorrow we are having an experts meeting. We will really focus on this, updating the indicators. So all of you are welcome. So uh, may I uh, try again with our online speakers, sir? Um, may I try with uh, maybe Matthias? Uh, from Germany, are you there? Because I never failed to connect him in in my past years with him. Hi, Matthias, I see you clearly. Could you please take the floor? Uh, 
uh, you, you sound fantastic. Please go on. <laughs> I'm so happy eventually. Yes, please uh, share your screen. And uh, I also plead if the technical support can still try to increase uh, the volume. Yeah, that helps. Yeah, we see your uh, screen um, very clearly and hear you wonderfully. Please continue. Thank you. Could you try it for the full screen? Otherwise, we can still see it. OK, we can try it again. Mm -mm.
Thank you for this uh, breaking through remote participation from Matthias. Uh, may I try another uh, online speaker from uh, Lucien Castix? Sorry, you are muted. Hello? 
I cannot hear you. I still cannot. Yeah, now you are okay. Please continue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing the French experience. I'm now inviting Anelia Dimova, representing the Ministry of E-Governance from Bulgaria, to share your project in the country. So Anelia, could you please take the floor? Yes, thank you, Yes, we do. Um, it's it's slightly difficult uh, for time being. Uh, is that possible? You can talk without the presentation. Also, we are really short of time. Yeah, I'm sorry that uh, it was not um, <laughs> foreseen that uh, you cannot uh, share the screen. We cannot hear you, Anelia. I think you are muted. Yes, now it's okay. Please continue. Thank you.
Yeah, we're on time. Uh, Anelia, uh, excuse me, could you please wrap up a bit? We are a bit. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Anelia, for your understanding the collaboration. Uh, we are really uh, at a sharp time to start the following session on a strategic discussion. Although I'm so much wanting to open the floor for some quick questions. So maybe one minute, anyone has some burning questions you want to uh, address uh, for those national uh, presentations before I move to the next uh, strategic discussion and signal to me now. OK, yes, please. Um, Please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, you. Hi, Catherine Townsend, Director of Policy at the Webb Foundation. Thank you to everybody who has presented. I'm looking forward to reading and learning more about your presentation because I couldn't follow all of the French. But I'm, I am curious, when you're looking at um, the work that you're doing nationally, what methods or what organizations or pathways do you use to share and understand um, the work that's happening in other countries? Are there, are there platforms that have been helpful um, so that we can expand this kind of learning or the processes and methodologies that you use? Um, do you have good partnerships and relations that have been particularly beneficial? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any other uh, quick comments, questions? Yes, please. Uh, the member of Parliament from Swaziland. Yes, please. Uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the use your neighbors. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I've got greetings from the uh, Kingdom of es Eswatini. Uh, I will want to appreciate uh, all the presentations, which I have enjoyed very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Honorable uh, Tanding Malo, a member of uh, Eswatini Parliament. And I'm also a member of par Parliament in uh, Pan-African Parliament, which is a legislative organ of AU. My question is that uh, what level has UNESCO worked with AU on Romex? Has UNESCO considered the AU Agenda 2063 and how Romex fits into it? Thank you. Thank you. And yes, Asra, uh, Asra please. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my question is, multi-stakeholder advisory board is very important. And the civil society really have limited control over there. And the government is the sole authority be forming this multi-stakeholder advisory board. And many of the recommendations are targeted towards the government. And that uh, uh, provides lights on the law regulation practices. So how far in the countries where this report has been adopted, what is the recipiency of the government? How how open the government is to towards those recommendations and what is the experience of uh, UNESCO regarding that? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any, any more? I try to address each question by one sentence before we moving to the next session. Uh, um, Thank you so much for those valid points uh, received. For the first question on platform, yes, we do. We have the project website, and also we, ha we are launching a new uh, monitoring interactive uh, map of all the national projects, which will allow for very useful database uh, sharing of different countries' projects. So uh, if that interests you, you can contact me after this meeting. I'll share with you more information. Regarding the distinguished delegate from the, the African Union and Parliament, uh, the question on what level collaboration with the uh, African Union. Since 
the very beginning, I mean, five years ago, when we started to develop the indicator, we've been consulting with the African Union, which is a part of the process. And while we are deploying the indicators in Africa, we've been keeping the collaboration with uh, with African Union. And as you said, the African Union 2063 strategy is one of our reference to implement these indicators in Africa. That's why we are le leading to here the success of having 17 African countries on board. And uh, I fully agree with you for next time, we need to have more systematic collaboration with the AU to, 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 to really um, uh, touch base on the latest developments of the, on both sides. So I also suggest we have a conversation at this meeting to, to discuss our future collaboration on the AU. Particularly, we are having the ambition to do the assessment in all the African countries as a scale up in the forthcoming years. Last one on the question about the multi stakeholder the government's role, that's a very tricky question. Uh, basically, in many countries, governments, they are not used to the culture of uh, multi stakeholder, which means they are uh, sharing their decision making power with other stakeholders. So it's a kind of a culture change. It's also a political reforms in many countries. It's also with the world to try to, to get in the government on board. We have succeeded in many countries like in Brazil, like in many other countries. But uh, uh, for UNESCO, that's why we are already following every step of national assessment. Uh, when you are uh, triggering the discussion, the policy recommendation on the validation workshop, we also have the UNESCO colleagues, our international advisor, to be present to deliver the international standard, to deliver the universal practice to help the other stakeholders to really to, to respect this, this game, to really uh, to take input from uh, every stakeholder equal footing. I trust this can be a topic and discuss more on tomorrow's experts meeting as well. So uh, I hope I can uh, have answered some of your questions. And if you allow me, I need to. Uh, can I make a comment on this? Of course, Dorothy, yes. please. Um, thank you. Because somebody earlier had said, I don't know if it was you or it was Prof, who indicated that um, the ministries who are present on the map just water down the report and then you end up with a report that is not going to have the kind of impact that you're looking for. We actually have quite a lot of techniques in how to write something without being critical and I think that this is something that we can explore in terms of how to frame what you're saying. So you would not say that the government has not made any progress in data legislation. You say that the government has been exploring data legislation possibilities as it, and is in the process. And these are some of the issues which will have to be addressed as it moves forward in that direction. So I'm just giving off the cuff, but I think this is really important um, sometimes we focus on the technical, which is what we are about, but a lot of times in building consensus, it is language, you know, how we frame things. So I think this is something that we have to pay more attention to as we move forward. And then there are techniques. For example, as the Member of Parliament was speaking, I can see me but it would not work in every country because I know many of my members of parliament. I will discreetly leak and then they will be discussing. And then the people in the ministry can't possibly say that that wasn't in the report. <laughs> you know, so depending on your country context as to what techniques you can use that will work. Thank you, Dorothy, for this very useful sharing. Now we are facing another impossible mission. In the forthcoming 25 minutes, I'm raising two big questions and uh, ask for five experts to share their view. And i also like to have some uh, intervention from the floor. So the first big question, I mean, the strategic discussion for today, building on what you have heard today and what have been on your mind today. And uh, what, uh, what do you think that uh, we should uh, update the role mix indicator and the implementation strategy 
after five years of the fast uh, digital transformation happening worldwide. Second question, I mean, how do you think the Rome project uh, framework uh, assessment can contribute to the operationalizing the UN Secretary General's roadmap for digital collaboration and uh, contribute to the global digital compact? So. That's a two big questions. I'm inviting five experts here. You are you are, you are you are free to uh, to pick one or focus on, or you can shed a light on two, but uh, stick to the three minutes. Thank you. Um, so first speaker is uh, Dorothy Gordon, the chair of UNESCO's Information for All program. Please take the floor and share your view in three minutes. Thank you. Okay, I'll, uh, Alessandro, can you help me with the timing? Um, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dorothy Gordon, and I'm the chair of UNESCO's Information for All program, which for the past over 20 years has been looking at how to build inclusive and equitable knowledge societies. So Rome X is, for me, one of the fundamental pillars that can help us to do this. And listening to everybody today, what I see, let me give you a few of the things that we need, we can explore further. First of all, I get the impression we're giving too much, um, we're giving too much weight to ministries of information or ministries of communication. Because in the past, we thought of digital transformation in a siloed way, focusing much on infrastructure. But if you look at Rome X, it emphasizes the transversal nature of digital transformation, and we have to have a more, a wider involvement of government. A wider involvement of government. I'm seeing some people who are wondering. Then I think that there's a lot we can do with what we've got so far. Even though we don't want to have comparative studies, we can look at where we have observed the data gaps consistently. And we can take that up at the regional level. I mean, I mentioned AU, I mentioned all these banks which have been involved. Why is it still that we cannot find data on women? It's ridiculous in the 21st century. So that has to happen. And we have to figure out how, I think we have to do a better explanation of how the gaps we are seeing are actually affect the policy gaps we are seeing are actually affecting development. So yes, we can have the traffic lights, but when you have the red, what does that mean in terms of achieving the sustainable development goals? What does it mean in terms of the consistency with the Secretary General's roadmap or global compact? I think we have to make those links very clear so that government can understand. Clearly, many countries are not addressing the vulnerable. And this has to be brought out. Why is it that we are disregarding people with disability consistently? Why is it that we still are not paying attention to people who are speaking different languages? And so critical government information is not reaching the population. So that has to come out. We need to address it together then I would say that there's room for us because I see too much focus on certain areas and not enough on the broad digital transformation. This is the main thing I want to say. And so I want to encourage, and this is for everyone who has already done the reports, let's do a little bit of drill down. Everything you discovered, what does that mean for a child of 10 who is going to school in your country today? How are those gaps affecting their ability to get a quality education? How are those gaps affecting people who are using e-government services, which are increasingly dependent on the use of AI? Do they have a knowledge of where their data is going, how their data is being used? I think we can drill down and do some of those cases. And then, of course, sorry, with education, I forgot OER. And then very important for climate change. In my country, Ghana, we have an energy commission. I would say UNESCO and the MAB writes to the energy commission in Ghana and ask them, have they done any analysis 
of the impacts on energy consumption that increased use of the internet is creating. So let's involve other partners. We don't have to do all the work. We just have to alert them to what's uh, going to happen. And so my, one of my main things, and I think that Catherine also said it, involve other partners with the conclusions that have come from the reports make it available to other partners so that they start using it. And then, the <laughs> let me quickly end by saying, we are one thing that comes out very clearly is the awareness level within government generally has to be improved. Too much focus, as I said at the beginning, on ministries of communication. But even there, the transversal nature of digital transformation and you know, multi-stakeholder, multidisciplinary, etc. It, it doesn't come through. We have to do something about that. And then I think that we don't want to do the comparisons, but we can have a small set of indicators, as I think somebody, was it from Ethiopia? Ethiopia said, look at the Horn of Africa. But we don't want to have 303 indicators for the Horn of Africa. We can just say, what are a few key indicators that they can agree on together that they will look at? We are not going to dictate, but they can look at so that we get a regional approach. And I'll leave it there. Um, I think that we are sitting on a wealth of information. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing so rich information through the three minutes. Please, Marusa, sit down, please. Okay, excellent. If you don't mind, yeah. I continue to uh, to move to our next speaker. Uh, actually, Saka Kadu, representing the IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Uh, I may I request that if you can just uh, finish three minutes uh, inputs without the uh, PPT, because I'm afraid that we don't have a time for that. I'm sorry if you can understand this. Thank you. Here, sit here. We have the case. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I actually have a short slide. If you could just allow me to do that within three minutes, I'll be done. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. You need the clicker. Please continue your intervention. I'm just uh, introducing Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gelasi, our ADG, coming to address the closing remarks. But before that, we still have uh, a few minutes to finish our strategic discussion. So please continue your remarks. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. You just press forward. Okay. So, um, as the chair has just indicated, I'm representing the International Federation of Library Association and Institutions, here we referred to as IFLA, and uh, I'm sure not so many of us may be having an idea about what IFLA is, so I'm briefly going to walk you through um, what IFLA is there for. Uh, uh, it's mainly uh, three important areas, it's threefold important areas to look at. Uh, IFLA is about inspiring, engaging, enabling, and connecting the library field, and two, ensuring everyone can benefit from excel excellent library services. And three, ensuring libraries have the resources and support to provide uh, those uh, library services. Uh, we have about three reflections to share with you. One is that public access does not actually uh, become less important once, once there is wider personal access. Uh, and two, the pandemic has underlined the laws uh, that can stand in the way of internet universality, as we just heard from the colleague from Kenya. And then libraries uh, bring the potential to be spaces, not just for digital skills, but also for digital uh, citizenship. And from uh, listening to the introduction of this session from the chair, uh, she posed two big questions uh, on updating, and this is the response. One, we need to update and, up, uh, and broaden the approach um, to what counts as meaningful connectivity, including public access. And two, we need to explore the possibilities to work with 
uh, and through libraries that broaden the stakeholder base. Uh, as I did mention, not so many of us always think about libraries as a priority, and yet this actually has uh, all of us, it actually serves all of us. We interact with the information and it would respond to the Rome X reviews. And thirdly, to draw on the Rome X principles to offer up a potential framework for measuring the success of work around the global digital con compact. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaka, for signaling the important role of library for Rome and also for the digital compact. Now I'm moving to the next speaker, Henriette Astor-Hussan, the executive director of the Association for Progress Communication. Are you, are you here with us? She was here. But she ah, she left. Yeah. Uh, ah. I mean, she, uh, she has another commitment. So now I'm introducing my colleague, uh, Mr. Elvis Mike, Mike, Michael Kanu, uh, the UNESCO Regional Advisor in Dakar. Could you please share your view on these two questions? Thank you. Um, I'm afraid that I might be long, but I think because we are going to have more discussion tomorrow on this issue, I may just uh, highlight that um, actually when we look into all the indicators and the teams covered by the IUI, we can see a direct link between these teams and the eight key actions of the SD uh, roadmap for digital cooperation. And in my view, I believe that it is through the IUI uh, assessment, we inform stakeholders on what they are doing toward those key actions area. And by informing them, we can also use the IUI report as advocacy for countries to actually work toward achieving the key actions that have been outlined in the uh, SD uh, uh, roadmap for digital uh, cooperation. I'll stop here and then we can continue discussion tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. That's really brief. Now I'm introducing David Suter as the author, a leading author of the Yomex indicators to share your view. Thank you, David, for making it. Thank you. Okay, my apologies for not being here earlier in the day. I'm working with the Secretariat this week, so I had other responsibilities uh, to do. I thought it might be useful if I just said something about um, sort of reflections on um, how uh, the reports that I have seen as they have been prepared during the last three or four years, uh, and also one or two things about the range of indicators and how they might be might evolve. Um, so uh, firstly, I think um, uh, more countries have, uh, have taken this opportunity up than I had expected, and I think that's very positive. But it also indicates that there was a, um, uh, perhaps a deficit that needed to be filled here that UNESCO has moved into. Um, and we, uh, there are other deficits around that that um, can be moved into from where we are at present. Um, secondly, I think uh, here I'm following on from Dorothy. Um, the purpose of the exercise was never to demonstrate uh, how good a country is, how well a country is doing. It was always to try and identify how it could improve in relation to the set of uh, themes that are included in the Romex uh, process. Um, now, in a few cases, governments have seen it as the former, as being about showing how good they are. Um, and uh, it's much more valuable to do the latter, so to identify the areas for po potential improvement. And I like Dorothy's notion of really being cumulative here rather than comparative, I think, country on country. Um, uh, thirdly, the most useful reports that I have seen here are those that have treated the IUIs as a starting point for an analysis of the national internet environment. And that's something that I think has often been the case with the media development indicators. Um, uh, and the, the least effective have been those that have seen it as a checklist, uh, just going through the various indicators and saying this is what is happening. So and so, uh, I think that perhaps we need to emphasise more in uh, in the discussions between UNESCO and uh, uh, the multi-stakeholder boards when setting them up that th that that ana analytical approach is, is most positive. In terms of use of indicators, so the range was always intended to be extremely large, so that countries could make a collage from the evidence which is available within those countries, and that's clearly never going to include everything. However, no country has chosen to go significantly beyond the core indicators, and I think we therefore need to reflect on whether there are elements in the other indicators that should be brought into those core indicators and a smaller list developed. Um, 
and uh, fifthly and finally really um, the digital environment is constantly changing and so anything in this that's four or five years old needs to be updated so there are some additional issues such as um, policy development regarding AI here I think also actually responses to growing online fraud um, uh, that might be incorporated. There are additional indicators which now exist and there are some new international standards. I draw attention in particular to General Comment 25 on the Children's Rights Convention which I think is a model um, uh, um, uh, assessment of how the digital and the existing human rights regime can work together which should be incorporated in things uh, such as the IUIs. So everything like this needs regular updating and clearly it would make sense to update it in the context of the Global Digital Compact. Uh, thank you, thank you, David, for this wonderful sharing. Actually, we have some minutes to open the floor <coughs> to share some views from our audiences. I mean, on this strategic topic, uh, what do you think Rome can be updated, and how do you think we can contribute to the UNSG's Global Digital Compact? So if you have any comments and insights, please take the floor. We have uh, three to five minutes to hear from you. Yeah, Alexander. Yes, please, Alexander. Thank you so much, Shen Hong. I think that uh, David has touched on a very important point, that we have more than 300 indicators and no country has conducted the whole assessment. This is a signal to us that we should really revise and reduce the number of indicators. And uh, as I said before, um, an hour ago, uh, it's not the matter of reducing the Romex dimensions, but uh, including some new um, uh, sub-dimensions like in the X dimensions, like climate change, uh, artificial intelligence, privacy and data protection. And I was saying, you were not here in the room, uh, uh, David, in, in Brazil, when we uh, first conducted the uh, assessment, we have identified uh, some gaps. Uh, Brazil has a, a very developed uh, legal framework in terms of internet governance and uh, digital technologies. But data uh, protection at that time, in 2018, we still uh, didn't have the data protection law approved. It was approved. The National Agents for Data Protection was established, and this year, is, I mean last year, but we concluded this year, uh, an assessment on the data and personal data uh, privacy and personal data protection assessment in cooperation with the government to uh, make a diagnosis of how uh, companies, the government, or critical social areas like education and um, health are adapting the legal framework for data protection. And I think that those dimensions should be considered in this new post-COVID era in terms of the Romax assessment. But we have a space to reduce dramatically uh, the some dimensions that today we have um, in total more than 300 indicators. So this is my, my message. I think that uh, uh, Romex is an extremely useful uh, framework in several dimensions in terms of uh, not only internet but artificial intelligence and other uh, um, ICT uh, emerging digital technologies that has great impact in society and human rights. So uh, I, we need to make it even more uh, well adopted uh, by countries but in a revised version probably. So those are my main ideas. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for sharing my message. Any other quick? Uh, yes, Dorothy, please. Oh, uh, yeah, Rao, maybe, maybe Rao, you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I fully endorse uh, what Alexander uh, said with regard to the, the need of simplification in order to have uh, more. Um, more information for uh, about more countries and, and more easy, easier to compare and to put together it, uh, to to take conclusions. Um, I um, agree very much with some points too that Dorothy uh, brought to the discussion earlier today. As one of the things that that we need, we don't. I don't know if I, I fully agree with the expression. I, we don't want to compare, but <laughs> but I think that comparing at some point is not bad. But uh, but taking that as a, as, a, as, a, as something that that we can agree on, um, 
this, uh, there is a need, as, as you said, that uh, I agree with you that that uh, that we need to have some uh, conclusions and to show the, the the conclusions to the to the governments in order to encourage them to take actions. And the, the other things that you pointed out is the the complexity of uh, bringing together leaders from different areas of the government, uh, and this is probably the the key issue in this uh, in all in all this environment in the, in the IGF. Um, and this is a problem. It's a, a, a in in my daily job. I uh, I. I have contacts every day with uh, with representatives of the governments uh, from different areas, but they don't they don't talk enough uh, between them, and and when we come we, we come to international uh, meetings like uh, this one, uh, the problem is that the the people that is representing the governments is is not the same that we that 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 we talk <laughs> it's, uh, in, on daily basis. So there is no translation. Um, of uh, this kind of discussions to effective actions. And so the policy development process, in especially in the in the in the in, in the majority world, as uh, we say now, uh, instead of global south, the uh, this is uh, the the this is the the, the standard. Uh, so the in order that that to make really efficient this the, the things that we are doing here, we need that there is an. Uh, uh, a link between the discussions we are having here and the work that we are doing here, with the with the policy making at the uh, at the national level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rao. I'd also like to pay tribute to your early support at ISOC when we started to develop the raw mix indicator. Thank you. And Dorothy, please, can you limit your I, argument to yes, two minutes? Yes, actually, you. I'm only going to remind us of something that was said earlier. One of the presenters said that what they are seeing is that governments do not have the resources to implement the policies that they have already agreed on. And this is very important for us to take into account. If with Rome X we are trying to encourage new policy, better policy, and we already have policy and there's no money to implement the policy. I think we have not thought about it. Can Was it you, Alain, who said it? Alain was saying it, that the policies are there. They do not have the resource envelope to allow them to implement the policy. I think this is a very critical issue that we should take into account. Thank you so much, Dorothy, for all your wonderful inputs. I think now I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, Taufik Jalassi, UNESCO's Assistant Direct General uh, for Communication Information. And uh, just before you came, I brief you that uh, regardless of the technical difficulty, I congratulate all of us who have managed to allow for the presentation online, offline from 14 countries. And then we opened the floor three times to have the intervention from the everyone. And then we come up with a strategic discussion. Also, we have the, another interactive uh, exchange. So uh, now, time's yours, Mr. ADG. Uh, please uh, take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be with you here uh, at the end of this important session on shaping global digital governance and achieving meaningful connectivity to all. I am delighted to see many familiar faces in the room and some of the partners of UNESCO, some of the key stakeholders we have, and obviously the topic that uh, you have been discussing, you know, the Rome X approach, the Internet Universality Indicators, and the exchange that I just attended now between David, Alexander, Jean, Dorothy, I think uh, I'm sure other experts uh, that spoke earlier uh, this afternoon had very sound uh, recommendations. Uh, the issues of are we comparing or not, uh, in a way, maybe that is not really that important. What is important is what lessons have we learned from 44 countries having conducted a national assessment through Rome and through the Internet Universality Indicators. What lessons have we learned, what conclusions, what findings, what recommendations that we can translate into action going forward. 
UNESCO, I was told when I joined one and a half years ago that we are not in the business of co comparing or ranking. At the time, it was the word ranking was used. Uh, there are other bodies, other entities, whether it's the World Economic Forum, Davos, or others who rank countries on uh, the uh, digital or internet readiness uh, index or whether it's on the innovation index, etc. Because you are approached by these bodies to say, join us. And the, the, the response was, we cannot join you because UNESCO is not in the ranking business. And we cannot be. We have 193 member states. We don't want some member states to say, how come that you put us at the bottom of this or uh, at the top of that? Are you really objective, neutral, and biased, or are you favoring one side or taking sides? So this is why UNESCO is not or hasn't been in the ranking business. Uh, a comparison, I'm not sure that's really the essence of it. But the lessons to learn, the conclusions to draw, the insights for uh, paving the way going forward, and how to turn recommendation to, into action based on what you have learned. My colleagues heard me many times saying, we have the individual publication, starting with Brazil, which was the first country having done the Rome X uh, assessment, and the most recently Germany, or one of the most recent uh, countries having done national assessment. We have individual publications per country. But let's look across these publications, across this national assessment. We should be able to come up with a very rich set of learnings of lessons that can inform the next countries going forward, but that could inform us, and here's my second point, on simplifying, on updating the indicators. So again, number one, uh, what lessons have we drawn that can uh, 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 pave the road for the next phase? Number two, uh, how can we simplify uh, these indicators? And you are absolutely right, Alexander, to say, at least to my knowledge, there is no one single country that has used 303 indicators when conducting a national assessment. So what is the subset that is most often used or has proven to be most relevant, most value adding? There must be a common set. I, and I don't think that 44 countries every time used a different subset. I don't think so. There must be an intersection of key indicators that were used from GRULAC, Latin America, Caribbean, to Western Europe, to Asia, to Africa. And I'm glad that we have 17 African countries among the 44 nations that have used our internet universality indicators to conduct national assessments. So I think um, uh, simplifying, yes, maybe focusing more on a core set of indicators that have proven to me to be most useful. That's very important. The third point I heard from Jean, I believe, is the updating uh, and the word that was used, the, I think it was also David who eloquently mentioned this, the, uh, the word around us is changing. Have we changed? And if you say yes, have we changed enough in the face of the changes around us? I think this is fundamental. And, and Alexander, you mentioned a number of changes. Artificial intelligence or other emerging technologies, that's one. The growing importance of data privacy is a second one and so on and so forth. You know it better than I do or as well as I do. So I'm not going to list what has happened since Rome was first introduced a number of years ago. So the world around us is changing. We have to keep pace with that. And you have to reflect those changes into the indicators. The approach remains the same, human rights based, open, accessible, multi-stakeholder approach on cutting, cross-cutting issues. And one of you mentioned climate change as a recent cross-cutting issue, uh, uh, for sure. But the point is, when it comes to the indicators, I think we have to reflect the changes that has, have happened. Uh, I'm glad that uh, we not only we have this session in day zero, tomorrow I believe we have a couple of sessions. If I look at my uh, notes, we have a couple of sessions, expert meetings tomorrow to develop a training module and capacity building material for conducting Rome X national assessments of internet development. I think these two sessions of tomorrow are very, very important going forward. Clearly, I think this discussion and what, have hap what has happened so far shows UNESCO can, be, can contribute, can be in the lead among others, but of course this is a collaborative effort. I mean, this is truly inclusive multi-stakeholder. These are not empty words because they are quite often used, but really they carry a very strong meaning. Academia, research, research institutions, civil society organizations, member states, UNESCO secretariat, 
private companies, the technology players. This is truly a multi-stakeholder approach, and we have to ensure that it's truly inclusive as well. Uh, so I really invite all of us uh, to do more in sharing best practices, in sharing, as I said, the lessons we have learned from national assessments, and also to make sure that we keep in mind how can we, through this, promote freedom of expression, uh, human rights, how can we promote uh, uh, pr uh, data privacy, how can we promote gender equality as well, digital inclusion and digital innovation. Uh, UNESCO, you know, has a long track record in terms of uh, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, safety of journalists. We have been for 30 years organizing annually the World Press Freedom Conference and awarding the UNESCO World Press Freedom Prize. Uh, so again, we are not coming uh, from the blue to try to tackle these. Uh, we have, we have a, a quite track record. The point is how can we leverage that? How can we inform? the next phase of this work. But not only Rome, Rome is at the core of it, but there are other issues that need to be stressed. You know, UNESCO has two global priorities, Africa and gender equality. We are in Ethiopia, we are in Africa. Why only 17 African countries among 54? 17 out of 54. That's not even one third who have so far used the Internet Universality Indicators. And I know, having been a Minister of Technology in Africa, I know, in North Africa, I know that many African countries are thirsty for using such indicators to, ha to be informed by such roadmap and being helped in capacity building as well uh, to do something like this. So I think that's on the Africa global priority, on the gender one for sure, and all our studies show at best, we talk about 20% women involved in technology today, and even much a smaller percentage in AI-related work. So we have a, still a long way to go, maybe through STEM education, maybe through advocacy, maybe through training, capacity building, really to improve the gender uh, situation and bring in more women uh, in our joint work when it comes to digital and ICT technology related. I know that uh, we are already five minutes over uh, the, uh, the scheduled ending time of the session. I wanted to share with you some remarks, not more than this. We hope that together we can uh, further impact the world of digital and the future development of information systems and digital applications. Rome X is very powerful. In my view, it can be even more powerful, more impactful going forward. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, ADG. If I have a last tweet, I'd like to thank uh, the technical support. Uh, thank you for helping with this complex session. Uh, we, uh, well done. And also, I'd like to recognize the presence of the father of the internet, uh, Vin, Mr. Vinserf. <laughs> thank you for your support. <laughs> and uh, thanks to everyone and the UNESCO here with you. And just as a last uh, reminder to everyone, don't forget uh, our uh, Dynamic Coalition session on Friday. So uh, please uh, come, uh, and uh, we are going to be exactly discussing how to take this, uh, this uh, way forward. Uh, uh, Hong, can you tell us a time and, and uh, confirm time and, uh, and place for the Dynamic Coalition meeting? It's 9.30 to 11 on the morning of this Friday, which is the 2nd of December. Uh, Mariosa will chair a session. We are waiting you there. See you there. Thank you. Bye. Excellent. Thank you very much.